Uh, we have uh, we have reached our, our halfway point, and uh, in celebration, I have some some majestic mammals for you today. Uh, the the hoary marmot, a, a furry creature that lives in the mountains of the northwest, um, uh, lounges majestically. Uh, uh, appears in in small groups sometimes, um, and uh, these creatures uh, hibernate in the winter, and so they will actually uh, double their body weight in spring and fall, so that they can uh, go sleep in a um, or hibernate in a kind of grass lined uh, den. So this is a, a marmot collecting those grasses and. Uh, I, don't know, I think they're just kind of uh, majestic creatures while also just looking sort of chill and, and lazy. Um, I have my own marmot encounter to share with you. Where was this? Uh, this was in the, the Cascade Mountains, although it is having great difficulty streaming the video from here to here. Cool. But it was a it was a, a marmot that was really not not very concerned about people. Uh, all right, what questions do you have about uh, bomb lab uh, assembly procedures, anything like that? Sass. When I was doing stuff with GDB, I noticed that sometimes I had to parentheses mean dereference it, right? But sometimes there wouldn't be parentheses, and I would stop to dereference it in order to access it. And sometimes there wouldn't be parentheses, but I'd have to use. Wait, no. Sometimes it was reversed. For a while, I used it D or like print or the P or the X in order to find what was sort of And it wasn't, it wasn't consistent with if there were parentheses or not. So if you have a pointer stored in a register, yeah. you can move that pointer, that memory address, to some other register. Yeah. And that would not include parentheses because we're not dereferencing. We're just setting like pointer yeah, x okay. equal to pointer y. It was such a lot of the comparisons I found. No, I'll, maybe 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 I did it. Well, if it is parentheses, it always means dereferencing, correct? Yes. Okay. And yes. if there aren't parentheses, it always means it's just the register. That's right. Um, okay. Yes, that's yeah. If there are parentheses around the register. We're dereferencing it. Um, and what it points to in memory may be another memory address. We could have a pointer to a pointer, for yeah, example. Yeah. Um, uh, and if there aren't parentheses, or it's just getting whatever values in the register. Okay. John? I sometimes have this like <clears throat> this issue where I wanted to like, especially for, for part six, um, I wanted to like access a specific spot in memory. And I it would say like, you know, this this memory address is not accessible. Uh, or something like that. But then, like, if I like added to that memory address, like if I if I did an offset of that memory address, it would allow me to access the memory there. So I was wondering, and like it didn't it didn't seem to be like logically to make sense of why one would be accessible and the other would not be accessible. So I was wondering about that. So let me make sure this doesn't go to sleep. Um, Um, so, in that layout of memory that we revisited last time with the stack and the heap and the different kind of parts of, of memory, those, if a memory address falls outside one of those regions, the operating system may not allow a program to access it because it's not part of the memory that belongs to that program. So. Uh, that would be one explanation for, for what you were seeing. There may be others I would have to see the specific values involved. Uh, oh, sorry. Yes, that is a great point. Uh, the one exception to when we see parentheses, it always dereferences, is if that's part of an LEA instruction. 
it will not dereference. It will just get the memory address and copy it to whatever the destination is. Um, and yes, yeah, so as far as I know, that's only LEA that, that has that behavior. Other questions? All right, so we were, at the end of last time, had kind of gone through a thought experiment to say, we can't really do function calls and returns using jumps. We're going to need some particular mechanism that allows us to uh, return to, to where we call, call the function. So uh, if we have a situation where some procedure P calls procedure Q. So maybe it's um, for example our main uh, function might call printf to, to print some output. There are three things that we need our sort of calling convention or mechanism for making function calls happen, there are three things we needed to do. Uh, number one, we needed to kind of pass control of the program from P to Q. We need main to kind of hand off what is happening in our program to whatever printf needs to do. And the uh, specific mechanical thing we that we need to happen is our RIP register, our instruction pointer that has the address of the next instruction to be executed. This Set back to the address of the first instruction in Q. So, in order to cause, say, in this case, the first instruction of printf to have a next and, and execute from there. The second thing that we need to do. We need to be able to pass data into functions. So we want to we want to print something. We need to give it the format string and any any additional things that printf should fill in for that for that format string. And so that's the arguments going in and potentially. the return value coming back out of whatever function we're calling. And as we've talked about before, we have specific registers designated for this purpose. We have specific registers that hold the arguments to a function. We have a specific register that holds the return value. Third. We need this, whatever kind of mechanism we're using to have procedure calls happen, we need to allocate, it needs to allocate and deallocate memory. So, uh, in particular, printf might need space for local variables. And in that case, whatever happens when main calls printf needs to allocate space for the local variables in printf, and then when printf returns, that needs to include deallocating a memory for those local variables so that uh, we don't just accumulate more and more memory used for every function call we want to free the memory once, once we're done with this. And This is going to require separate storage for each function call. 
We can't have just one place in memory that is going to have everything a call is like the one place that a call to printf always uses because different calls to printf might have different values for their local variables. And so each, each function call is going to need its own, its own storage in order to make this happen. Questions on these, these three goals? Okay. Is this allocated and deallocated memory different than when we were moving the RSP register at the start of the end of the function? This allocate and deallocate memory is accomplished exactly by moving RSP at the beginning and end of functions. Like that grows the stack, allocates memory, shrinks the stack, deallocates memory. So, yeah, that's. To, to do this memory allocation by moving the stack pointer down as the stack grows into lower addresses and adding to, to the allocate. Other questions? Is, is there, there any check to make sure there's enough space in the stack before this happens? Or? Um, it's an interesting question. Is there a check that the stack has enough space? Um, there will be a check so you can, uh, there, there is a, yeah, so when we have our address space laid out, we have the stack and the keep growing toward each other, and the stack uh, is at very high addresses, heaps at uh, middle addresses, and it would be possible for all this space to be used up, in which case uh, this system is going to start killing programs uh, because it's out of memory. And it will try and, and this happens sometimes on, um, or I, I have caused this to happen sometimes running uh, research code that like uses 200 gigabytes of, of memory. The system will try and uh, uh, kill programs for a while, and then we'll eventually uh, give up and, and shut down. <laughs> so uh, there's not, it's less a check on these specific subtract and add, um, because as we'll talk about on a midterm break, this picture of, of memory is a, uh, a like convenient fiction the operating system is telling all programs, and it is handling the actual physical memory underneath. Uh, and so the amount of space here, in most cases, will actually be much, much, much bigger than the amount of physical memory on the machine. So uh, you're more, you're, it's, it would be much more common to run out of physical memory before these ever like use up all the, the, the memory addresses in, in the screen. Other questions? John? I think kind of on that point, I think you mentioned earlier in the term like it's useful for all machines to kind of have like the same amount of like, virtual memory, but like if if they just end up running out of physical memory anyway, eventually, like how is it how is it helpful to have like such a thing that there's a huge sum of virtual memory? So I'll just give the the short answer to this because we'll talk a lot more about virtual memory uh, later. It's convenient to have the stack always at the same addresses, heap always at the same addresses whenever you run a program. And so giving every program the same address space from zero up to FFFF in terms of the range of addresses it can use um, just means that we can compile a version of our program once and run it on, say, any Linux machine and it always gets the same address space. It doesn't have to be different each time. Um, with 32-bit memory addresses, our address space is 4 gigabytes. A lot of computers have more than 4 gigabytes of memory, and so 32 bits, no program can have use more than 4 gigabytes of memory if it's 32 bits, because that's just how many addresses you have. And so, yes, yeah, 64 bits, way bigger 
than the amount of memory computers currently have, but um, 32 bits has uh, limitations that um, are, are meaningful and constrain what programs can do. Other questions? All right, so I want to talk about this pass control piece first, uh, and then about uh, these other two. So to pass control, we have the call and return instructions. So return doesn't take any arguments. Call queue will come with some address. And Related to how when we want to pass control, we need to make the next instruction we execute be the first instruction in the function we're calling. Call Q will have that address as its operand. And so what does call Q do with this? It does two things. It's going to push the return address onto the stack. So if we have we have some function foo does some things, then it calls printf, uh, and then uh, after that it will um, Now continue on its way and add one to RAX, just let's say. And so this printf here, when we actually compile the program, will be filled in with a memory address, the address of the first instruction of, of printf. So uh, when we're looking at something that's been gone from C code to assembly, but not all the way to binary executable, we'll just have this label, and then we'll get filled in with a memory address as part of that linking step uh, that I, I talked about a few classes ago. And let's say that this call Q instruction is at stored at address 100, and this add Q instruction is stored at address 104. What address what is the address of the instruction that we want to execute once printf returns? Add Q, right? One of four. Yeah, exactly. The address of the instruction we want to happen after the return is the address of the instruction right after the call instruction. So we're going to call printf, go wherever that is in memory, do those things. When that returns, we want to pick up where we left off. And so our return address, the address of the instruction we want to return to, is going to be the one right after the call. So this push return address onto the stack. That's the address of the instruction right after the call, because that's where we want to come back to. Second thing that call Q needs to do is change our instruction pointer, change our IP register to the address of the first instruction of the function we're calling. When I get to a call, we're going to push our return address onto the stack, change RIP so that the next instruction that gets executed is the first instruction of our procedure. Questions so far?
So return just does one thing. It will pop the return address off the stack that we pushed when we call the function. It's going to pop that off into our instruction pointer. So in this example here, our call queue, it will push 104 onto the stack, and then it will change our IP to be the address of the start of printf. Printf does all its stuff. We get to the return. 104 is on top of the stack, and return pops that off the stack into the instruction pointer so that then this is the next instruction in the next case. Oh. Is that the way to myself and I'm still like the reality on the same memory in my program? Can you return it? It feels more like that. Yes. The return address is just sitting there on the stack with all our other data. And so, for example, if you were to overflow an array, also called a buffer, you might overwrite the return address and change what will happen when the current function returns. This is both a source of weird and unmalicious crashing behavior, also a incredibly uh, serious security vulnerability. And we'll talk all about that next Wednesday uh, for buffer overflow attacks. But the fact that our return address, we just keep it on the stack, uh, means that it's vulnerable to being overwritten. What's that? So if that's what's happening when we're looking at the assembly question, the function, and we do the incremental change, and then we have to do the So, Good question. If the subtract RSP and add to RSP, that's number three here. That's allocating, allocating memory. Now it's important that this happen in a particular way in relation to our return. Because our return popped the return address in RSP. It's not necessarily the return address, it's <coughs> whatever is on top of the stack. And so if we, we start our procedure by pushing our return address onto the stack, then we might allocate some memory for local variables, we subtract, and then before we get to the return, we better add that back so that RSP is back where we push the return address on. Because our return instruction is just gonna pop whatever is on top of the stack into our instruction. Right. So you would have that like, you can pop off the top and then put in whatever you want so that whatever turn is still order. Yeah, because it's just going to use whatever's on top of the stack, that's why if we over say overwrite the return address, it's just gonna use whatever is we put there. Gotcha. Other questions? All right, the other two parts of this, um, or there's two and three here, passing data and allocating memory. So, nope, out of here. Uh, all right, this should be faster. Want to bring up a chart that we've seen before? No, not here. I was right the first time. So, this is a chart that we've I think, seen briefly before, but this is uh, part of passing, this is the main mechanism for, for passing data, that uh, when we want to provide arguments as, as input, we have 
six registers that are by convention will be used for the, those arguments. So before P calls Q, it's going to move the first argument into RDI, second argument, RSI, and so on. And before Q returns, it's going to put its return value in RIX. And so we use these registers to, to facilitate um, uh, this passing of data. And uh, in terms of allocating memory, let me draw this on the board. So we have here's our stack. drawn upside down as, as usual, higher addresses to lower addresses, lower being the, the top of our stack. And of each section of memory on the stack that a particular procedure is using is called uh, its stack frame. So that's the term for we subtract from, from RSP. Uh, that portion of the stack is the stack frame for the current function. And so in this picture, there's some portion of the stack that's used as kind of the frames for earlier function calls we, we've made that kind of led to the, the, the current call. Then we might have a frame for our, proceed, uh, our function p. And something that uh, came up in, when I first talked about these argument registers is that we only have six of them. And it's possible that a function could take more than six arguments. And uh, for that, um, uh, in order to facilitate that, we need to put arguments beyond the sixth onto the stack. That is how, and then the uh, uh, function we're calling will find those seventh, eighth, ninth, etc. arguments on the stack. So, We would have uh, something like this where we may have kind of pushed a whole bunch of arguments onto the stack. Uh, if, if, the fun if Q, the function we're, we're going to call, takes more than six, then when we call Q, we push the return address onto the stack, and then we have the stack frame for Q, which uh, might consist of saved registers, local variables, and what's called the argument build area, which is just a, a place where you push the arguments beyond the sixth for some function that, uh, that you need to call. So this shows kind of all the different things that we might use the stack for. We use it for return addresses, for arguments to functions that take a lot of them, for local variables, uh, and for saved registers. What registers do we need to save? That's the color coding of the registers shown on the screen. That the yellow ones, caller saved, means that within a function, it's allowed to do whatever it wants with these yellow caller saved registers. It can change what's in RAS in order to uh, 
to set up a return value. It can change any of the argument registers however it wants, as well as R10 and R11. All of our blue ones are callee saved, which means that a function has to ensure they have the same value at the end of the function that they had at the start. And as we've talked about, we're going to, at the start of the function, push the current value of those onto the stack to save them and then pop them off before we return back into those registers. Questions on, on any of this? Right. Why do we need anything that's colleague saved? Like why, what has, why, why is this arbitrary? Like, these are the ones that we always keep like, a constant, these are the ones that we don't. So, I suppose that x86 could have made uh, all of these registers caller saved, <laughs> as in a function always needs to, uh, say, push things onto the stack that it might need later. Um, but we've made this division of labor so that a uh, so that there are some registers a function can always use for whatever it needs to do, and there are some that if it needs to use them, it will have to, to save them. What are some examples of things that it would want to save? So, why don't we just look at an example of that now. So, uh, if we have... go. So I guess since I have this up here already, I will, this is an example of how we would use the stack for a local variable. So in this function, I declare a local variable that's an array of four longs. And in the assembly, I can see that I subtract 32 bytes from RSP and then move 3, 6, 8, 12, the values of my array, into the places within those 32 bytes on the stack. So that would be this like local variables piece. I can't store an array in a register. I have to put it in memory. And so just subtract from RSP to allocate the space and move stuff in there. And if I change this from an array of longs to an array of ints, I only subtract 16 bytes because that's all I need for, for four ints rather than 32 for four, for four longs. So Silas asked about uh, what would we, what's an example of when we need to save something? So let's say that our procedure P takes a long X and a long Y and it's going to call some procedure Q that returns a long and takes a long, but in this file, I'm, there's not, Q is not defined, I just know what its argument and return types are. And what P will do is call Q with Y, call Q with X, and then return U plus V. So, when Q of Y returns, that return value is stored in RAX. But RAX is going to be used for the next return value, the, next, the return value of call of Q to X. So what we will do is we will move RAX into a register that we know that a subsequent function call won't change, one of these callee saved registers. So this means that we can use a register to keep a value that, um, that we will need later. And if Q turns out to, to use RBX, it will store the initial value of RBX in memory and pop it off. But if it doesn't, we've saved ourselves a trip to memory and back. Because P can just put the value it needs later into one of these callee saved ones and it can then assume that it will still have that same value later in the function. So that, that's the utility of these. Uh, P doesn't have to preemptively put it in memory just in case Q would, would change that register. 
the very bottom there, it says hard fill area. Mm -hmm. and what is that? Uh, so that's the area where we would push arguments beyond the sixth into the onto the stack. So um, uh, if um, yes, yeah, so an example of this if I go on to Mantis. Uh, go into uh, the bomb that I have here. Texting about this, I'm just bored that guys are listening. <laughs> um, and if I do, I have this here. No. Um, if I look at this bomb and I look at read six numbers. Read six numbers is going to call scanf, but it's going to call scanf with eight arguments. It's going to pass it a string, a format string, and then six pointers for the six places it should store those six numbers. And so that is why there are two push instructions before the call, because these are pushing arguments seven and eight onto the stack, and that's what this arg build area, like. Most of the time, this wouldn't actually have anything in it, but if we're gonna call something that needs arguments beyond six, we'd push them onto the stack. Uh, and so they'd show up right before, on the stack right before we called, um, called some procedure. Other questions? All right, let's do a bit of practice, please. Come grab a card with your number. All right. So first, first we have this sort of odd bit of assembly. We call next. We have we know that the label next is there, and uh, after that we have a, a pop rax. So if we run this. Question is what is going to be stored in rax? And so think carefully about exactly what call, which is just call Q and call the same thing, uh, what, what's that, what is that going to do? All right, please discuss with your neighbors uh, how you're thinking about uh, what, what will get stored in RX. All right, we have, we have movement, uh, and in this case, in the correct direction. So, uh, can someone uh, explain how, uh, why you think it's going to be uh, C? Why? Yeah. Um, so we we do the instruction call next. That pushes the next bit of instruction, the, the location of the next instruction on the stack, and the next instruction in our assembly is pop q r e x. So that goes on the stack. Then we do pop q r e x, and so we pop the location of that instruction into r e x. Exactly that we just follow the, the steps that we, we know call does. It's going to be push the address of the following instruction out of the stack, and then set our instruction pointer uh, to the address that it's called with. That's the address of pop Q. Since that's where our label next is, we'll fill in that address, and then when we pop, that address is what's on the stack. Silas? Does this, does this ever happen where you have the function like assembly code directly following like the all the rest of this actually? No, this is a weird example to make us think about exactly what call is is doing. There's no like magic beyond these two steps. Yeah, yeah. Other questions. All right, one more. Nope, not that one. Okay. Yes, not the 111 questions. All right, here. 
There we go. Okay. All right. So we have this call graph, a function slurp, calls a function squish, which calls splat, which calls printf. And then squish also calls slop, which calls printf. And so how many uh, stack frames will be created and how many will be present on the stack at any one time? All right, please, quick discussion with your neighbors about how you got to the answer you did. All right, we have reached uh, near consensus. We will indeed have six frames, four at one time. Uh, why only four at one time? John? Go down one path, and then once you're done, you're going to Exactly. That when when we return from a function, we will have popped any saved registers back off the stack. We will have deallocated any space that we allocated with this with, by subtracting from RSP. And then the last part of the stack frame is the return address, which we pushed on. At the start of the function call, we'll print that off. So we will have completely uh, deallocated everything that was on the stack related to a function call after it returns. So we'll only have, if we call splat first, we can't call slop until splat has returned, um, giving us only four on the stack at a time. Questions on this? Lisa? Why do we have to create a new frame for why, are you asking why does printf have a stack frame? Like, like, why couldn't all of them just share one stack frame? Printf, yeah. Ah, so these two printfs, they have different return addresses, for example. They may be called with different arguments and this have different local variable values. Um, so in particular, because uh, functions always need to push the return address on, their stack frame will always consist of at least this return address, even if they don't need any other space on the stack. And so each call is going to need its own, so that it has its own return address. All right. That will be uh, the end of uh, our first half of, of 208. Uh, I sent out the, the midterm uh, survey uh, yesterday. Please take a bit of time to fill it out. That's really helpful feedback for me. Uh, have a good midterm break, and I will see you next Wednesday.